Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the executive director of FAN, and I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Hal Hirschfield and Dan Pink. Thanks for joining us. FAN celebrates its 40th anniversary this year, and we're almost finished with that year, and we're honored to have the robust support of dozens of schools, nonprofits, corporations, families, and individuals from across the country. We're committed to our vision of an informed and compassionate community, and will achieve that vision by presenting fresh ideas that elevate minds, expand hearts, and make the world a better place. We have hundreds of videos of past events archived on our YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe to get updates when new recordings are posted. And now for some introductions. Hal Hirschfield is a professor of marketing, behavioral decision-making, and psychology at UCLA's Anderson School of Management, and he holds the UCLA Anderson Board of Advisors Term Chair in Management. His research, which sits at the intersection of psychology and economics, examines the ways we can improve our long-term decisions. Professor Hirschfield publishes in top academic journals and contributes op-eds to the New York Times, the Harvard Business Review, the Wall Street Journal, and other outlets. He consults with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and many financial services firms such as Fidelity, First Republic, Prudential, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, and Avantis. Dan Pink, we love Dan Pink, is the author of seven books, most recently, The Power of Regret, How Looking Backward Moves Us Forward. We hosted Dan in 2022 on launch day for The Power of Regret. Oh, that was such a great event. And it was an amazing event. His other books include the New York Times bestsellers, When and A Whole New Mind, as well as the number one New York Times bestsellers, Drive and To Sell as Human. His books have won multiple awards, have been translated into 42 languages, maybe that number's bigger by now, and have sold millions of copies around the world. We had the privilege of hosting Dan for several events in 2018 for when the When book, for the When, for the One, for the When One, for the When book tour. That was the first time we hosted him, and we're grateful, so grateful to have him back in Fanland. So now let's welcome Hen Hal Hirschfield and Daniel Pink. Thank you, Lonnie. I am grateful to be back in Fanland too. I I appreciate that lovely introduction. I should say though that my uh, my our mutual friend David Epstein, yeah, he went to ETHS. He's a wild kid, but I feel like I deserve some points for being a wild cat and having spent four years in Evanston uh, and having a kid in Evanston at this very moment. So I just want I want to show my North Shore street cred here at the beginning. But more important, I want to um, thank Fan for hosting this and say say hello to my friend Hal. Hal, hi. Hey Dan, thank you, and and yes, thanks, fans, for hosting. Wait, I have to add though, um, you know, I did two years of postdoc at Northwestern, so you know, I feel like I have I have less claim here, but a little bit. Well, we're all we're all seeking. Everybody wants to be part of the fan universe, so we seek whatever <laughs> thread of connection we possibly can. All right, so. Um, so folks, you're in for a treat uh, because this book is not out yet. Uh, I had the opportunity to read it early. It's really, really good. It's really good. And one of the things that it did for me is that it's going to sound a little woo-woo, but it changed who I saw in the mirror. And we'll come back to that here in a moment. But before we get to the substance of Hal's terrific book, um, let's get, you know, we'll do like, it's like the Olympics. Let's do a little bit of up close and personal here. And so, um, you didn't emerge fully formed as a 40 something social psychologist tenured professor at UCLA. Um, where'd you grow up and, and, and how'd you find your way to do this kind of work? Um, I, I love that question. Uh, so I grew up in, I grew up in rural New Jersey, actually, uh, not a ton to do there. Um, my, my folks are actually both psychologists, uh, oh. and Growing up, that was, you know, when people asked me what I wanted to do, that was the one thing I said I didn't want to do. Uh, you know, I, I love them dearly, but I just knew that that wasn't my path. And of course, I I couldn't have been more wrong. Um, Are they, and, were they clinical psych, were they clinical psychologists or um, research psychologists? No, clinical. So I, so I guess technically I didn't go that that path, but I, I'm, but my wife is a clinical psychologist. So it doesn't, I, I can't get far away from it, I guess. But, uh, uh, but, but how did I, how did I come this way? Um, Actually, I think I can probably trace it back to one um, winter break. I was at home and I was bored and my parents, they subscribed to these academic journals, which sounds really boring, probably tells you like exactly like how little I had to do. <laughs> and I I uh, was kind of paging through and I came across this incredible article by uh, Laura Carstensen. She's a um, uh, psychologist who studies like aging and decision making and the article really moved me because it was all about how people think about time and how they think about hmm. 
their their feelings as they sort of move through time. And I, I was sort of this naive college kid. I, I wrote her an email to tell her how much I loved the, the work. And I started asking questions. And like, after a whole exchange back and forth over months, I ended up applying to grad school to work with her. And that was what kind of eventually got me down that the path to where I am now. Well, and how, how did you start studying? Did you study psychology as an undergrad? Yeah, so undergrad, I was a psychology and English major. Um, you know, both, I, I look, I, I like to read and both, uh, both disciplines really are like trying to figure out human behavior and understanding why we do the things that we do. You know, literature is amazing because it allows me to have this sort of creative lens and and read what what non-social scientists say. And then of course the social psychology and the psychology takes this, you know, more rigorous approach, but both are really looking at the same thing. Fantastic. So, so, so I, I think that, I mean, again, I, you know, I will try to extract a life, a life lesson from a cantaloupe, but I can easily extract a life lesson from that story there for, for those of you who are working with younger people, which is, you know, try stuff, reach out. There are a lot of people who might not have had the moxie to reach out to a tenured professor at Stanford, and it actually had a pretty profound effect on the on the course of your life. So, so speaking of this English major, I'm going to quote you back. We're going to do a little bit of text analysis here. And this is very illuminating to me because I thought one of the lines, when I knew this was a good book, Hal, was uh, in the very, um, I don't know what page it's on because I have my notes here, but very early on in the book, I'm going to read you a, a quote that I think encapsulates the idea here. And I want you folks, uh, the millions of you watching at home to listen to this here. In, this is Hal. Instead of there being a central self, a central self at our core, we are instead an aggregation of separate, distinct selves. You are actually a we. Explain. Right. So I think that's a showstopper. A back. That's a showstopper. <laughs> I'm serious. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. I mean, if you step back, part of what I was grappling with when I wrote that part and what I was thinking about the topics in the book, which I know we're going to talk more about, is what defines us over time. And, and in other words, how can we think about ourselves as being the same or different? If I think about the, the kid I once was, is that the same person as who I am now? If I think about myself in 10, 20, 30 years, is that the same person as who I am now? These questions aren't just philosophical. I know we'll, we'll get into it, but those are the types of questions I was really, I have been really excited about for, for much of my sort of, you know, academic life. And one way to answer it is rather than thinking about sort of this one self, I think it's a lot easier to grapple with identity if we are a separate collection or a collection of separate selves as, as, as you quoted back to me there. <laughs> Right. So we're, we're going we're gonna to get to the research here in a moment. I think that one of the things that's a sign of how profound some of these ideas are is that different disciplines and different people have different types of people have wrestled with this, have grappled with these with these questions, uh, philosophers. But you also give um, and, and I think this is a good launching point into the, the more specific scientific questions here. You also give, I think, a really brilliant uh, metaphor, uh, sort of literary uh, allusion to uh, Theseus's boat, um, which I have to say, I was only glancingly familiar with in that. And then I was like, after reading that, I was telling everybody, you know, um, about Theseus's boat, because I think it gives us a good idea of sort of the, the human component and the philosophical component of the research that you did. Yeah, so I mean, you know, that that's this this question. I, I I know a lot of people have heard of it, but then I think, like you said, sort of glancingly, like, and the the question is, you know, you you have this ship, it it leaves port and it's traveling around the world, and you know, after a little while, some of the 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 um the sail gets tattered and they replace the sail, and then the 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 boards you know start rotting out, and you replace those and. Uh, over and over and over, little pieces get replaced until the ship makes its way all the way back. And by the time it's back, every piece of it has been replaced. And the, the question the philosophers have grappled with for, you know, uh, much longer than we've been alive is, is it the same ship? Uh, and there's no easy answer to this question, but you can easily see how you can take that same question and apply it to our own lives, right? And say, 
think about all the things that have changed. I mean, I think, you know, I live in a different city. Like uh, I look different. My friends are different. You know, my name even has, has, has changed and many people's names have changed. You start with those questions and you say, wait, how can I define whether I'm the same or different over time? And it suddenly becomes um, profoundly difficult to answer these questions. Right, which is why I think these questions are so um, interesting to, to, to wrestle with, but to, because they go to the heart of who we are as human beings. So let's get to this. So your work, let's get to the science here. So your work, I think, is in part, um, uh, why, uh, why do human beings, um, uh, why, why don't human beings do things that they actually want to do? Yeah, that that's right. I mean, I, I would say, yeah, I'll just like add a layer to that, right? It's yeah. It's why do we fall short of doing the things that we want to do? And it's you know, so it's not like I mean, maybe that's pretty much the same as what you said, but it, it's not like I don't start, and I don't think any of my colleagues start from the perspective of you know we need more people to do more of these things. It, I, that feels too paternalistic. It feels too sort of value laden. I'm really interested in the questions where people say, "I want to do more of this thing. I want to." exercise more, save more, whatever. These are the sort of classic examples. But I, I just can't find myself the time or the energy or the inclination to do it. Those are the things that I'm, that gap there, that's what I'm really interested in with my, with my research. Oh, sure. Yeah. The things I, I might I might have misspoken. Uh, it's it's things that people say they want to do, but somehow they don't do them. So a great example of this early in your research, uh, you were a, practically a child when you did this, was uh, research on retirement savings. So you would think it's like you should save for retirement. Um, you're going to, you know, compounding interest is the most powerful force in the universe. And yet people don't save for retirement. And you came up with an ingenious intervention, now famous intervention to get people to save for retirement. Tell us what you learned um, and tell us why um, your little technique worked. Right. So, um, you know, part of the part, part of the question here is, right, why, why don't we do more of this? And I mean, we shouldn't put the, the onus on the individuals, right? There should be systems in place that can make this easier. But 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 part of the problem, you know, why don't we save or why don't we save enough is you know, we get too pulled in by the, the present. And a lot of what my research points to is that we don't relate to our future selves that well. They seem abstract. They seem way far from the distance. I'm not emotionally invested in them. Um, so, okay, so you, you asked about the, the intervention that we came up with, as you said, years ago when I was um, much younger than I am now, uh, we thought, well, okay, how do we get people to care about, how do you get people to do anything that involves taking care of another person? Uh, you know, you don't, you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Charities do this sort of thing all the time. They ask this question. Charities do this really well, right? I mean, I think everybody probably can point to this. Charities tell stories. They make examples vivid. Um, the stats are not that moving, but the picture is, the story is, right? And so you think about retirement, it's like financial advisors will say like, let me show you a compound interest chart. They think that's emotional, but for most people, that's that's not that emotional. So, okay, so we said like, how can we make, how can we make it vivid? How can we make it emotional for people? Um, we started playing around with age progression technology, which is a fancy word for technology that basically makes you look older. Uh, I mean, it's pretty interesting. It, it, it mimics the whole process of, of aging. So, you know, it, um, sags your cheeks and add some age spots and makes your hair. Am I, this is depressing. Maybe I don't need to go through the whole list. of. I have it, I have it on right now. I'm using that technology <laughs> yeah, right now. Yeah, yes, ex exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I played around with when I did it. Um, it's, it's wild. You like press the button and like, I look exactly like Ryan Gosling when I'm older. Um, <laughs> but so that's, um, that was, dumb. but uh, you know, it, it's when we first started using this, it wasn't the, the technology was kind of in its infancy it's, um, uh, you know, not perfect, but it, it was still a good example of trying to make this future self more visual, more vivid. What we found early on is that the people who see these images are a little bit more willing to save for the future. That was hypothetical. Um, my collaborators and I have a, a new paper coming out. It's supposed to come out this actually in June, um, where we worked with a, a bank. Uh, we uh, reached out to 50,000 customers, half of them got the opportunity to see their older selves and half didn't. Uh, and mm. the people who did were 
a little bit more likely, they were about 16% more likely to make a contribution to their retirement account. You know, these are, the numbers are end up being small, but when you think about like any intervention that can move the needle in this like messy territory, I, I'm happy with it. That that like is something I want to, you know, celebrate. So when so when people people when people see pictures of themselves at age whatever, at age 80, they become slightly more likely to save for retirement. Yeah. Explain, so I, go ahead. Yeah. I was gonna say more more like age 65. It doesn't it doesn't go that okay high up yet, but this is it actually kind of gets interesting when we think about these things. But sorry, I'll let you keep going. Yeah. No, so 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 and, and, but explain to us because I think it's fascinating. What's the mechanism there? What's going on there? Why is that? Why is why is seeing a picture of myself today different from seeing a picture of myself X years from now? Or why is seeing a picture of myself X years from now more motivating, inspires different kinds of behavior? Than seeing a picture of myself today. So I think part of it, okay, so you know, here's one way I like to think about this. One analogy I think about is if you were to see, um, if you were to watch sports on TV and the camera sort of pans across the crowd, uh, everyone is pretty abstract. It's kind of hard to pick out one particular person or think about any one particular person. If the camera sort of zooms in, decides to focus on one fan, it's not that hard then to start wondering, I wonder who that person is, what's their life like, where do they live, uh, do they go to games all the time? I, I think something similar is happening when we see an image of our future self, because without that, essentially our future self is, it's vague, it's sort of a combination of possible selves, but the image can really help sort of like rein things in. It's It's an aid for our imagination to really make it a little bit more um, vivid and something right. to sort of latch on to. Well, you use, you use the language of vision a lot in the book. And so you talk about the future self, the future in general being blurry. And so this offers a kind of a set of glasses to cure that myopia. And, and you, in a sense, recognize, hey, that old guy is me. That old guy is not some separate distant person that old guy is me and so i better start saving for that for that for, for for that for that person and a lot of what you talk about centers around this concept you mentioned it a couple of times this concept of vividness that we tend to act more when we see things that are um when when the the problem is vivid i mean um talk about this in, in in terms of in terms of charity i think there's some good examples of that or even in terms of collective action in in on political issues because i think i think that will help people i think that, that helps solidify it in people's minds yeah i mean you know one i think one example of this you said political so i'll go with i'll go with that i mean we you know you can think back um several years ago uh i guess it's probably 2015 or so um there's you know you, you think about a one of the refugee crises, one of the many that we've experienced over time. And for, for several years, there had been articles written about the refugee crisis and um, the need to change policy, the need to um, uh, donate and consider refugees. And then one day there was this tragic photo of, of a little, uh, of a, a family that had been, you know, trying to to leave their country and the little this little boy washes up on on shore is a, a tragic photo um that picture made headlines and the front page of newspapers all around the world and spurred more action in the matter of days and more of a focus on this particular crisis than i would probably guess you know all of the op-eds combined i'm probably i'm exaggerating you know the the numbers here yeah. but um the Interesting thing to think about here is that what was happening there is that suddenly now it's not this abstract concept. It's not just refugees overall. It's now everybody can point to this one child. Everyone can think about what that family must feel like. And that all of a sudden becomes much more motivational uh, than numbers. That, I mean, to bring it back, that's vivid. The numbers yeah. are abstract. Yeah. And and the and a problem is is that as you put it, I'm just rephrasing some of your language. We look at the present under a, mic, a magnifying glass, and yet the future is often 
is often blurry. And so what we want to do is actually try to change the distance between that. So, so give us some advice here. So what are some things that we can do? Recognize that all of us fall prey to this, that we're less willing to do something for our future selves because that future self, we can't quite see that person. And in, in, in a sense, that almost feels like somebody who's entirely different from who we are today. What are some things we can do as individuals to recognizing there's a systemic issues and so forth? What are some things we can do to close that gap? Right. So, I mean, I would say first off, I think it's okay to own that our future selves are thought of as other people. So they are separate from us. What I think we need to sort of get our heads around is that it, it can be a separate person who we feel a sense of connection to, you know, you know, like in the same way that we feel as if our best friends and our partners and our kids and parents, those are separate people, but we have different relationships with them. So I would say, you know, on a first level, it's recognizing that our future selves can be like the other people in our lives, but okay, more concretely. Um, so, you know, uh, I think the first place to start is figuring out how can we sort of close the gap between current and future selves? Um, I, of course, like, you know, the use of age progression, but that that's just like sort of one thing. I don't think it's, you know, like everybody's going to use this and I don't think it's going to uh, change everyone's lives and everyone's behavior. But one other technique that I really like is writing a or engaging in a send and reply conversation, a send and reply letter writing exercise. And what I mean by that is sending a letter to our future self, but then essentially writing a letter back mm. in response. And the reason I like that, and this is, uh, you know, of course, backed by the research, but the reason I like this is that it forces you to step into the shoes of your future self and sort of think back and figure out, okay, well, what would, what would that version of me be thinking about the things that I'm, I'm doing right now? Um, you know, I actually did have a, a colleague once who said that she often likes to think of her future self as just like a continual conversational partner, mm. um, which seems quite extreme to me. And, you know, it's not something that I, I do. Um, but I love the idea of having that be someone you talk to in big moments moments when there are decisions that will impact you now uh, and later. So, okay, so that's one bucket of things that I think we can do. So write, so write a letter to future you and write a letter from future you back to current you. And there are, Hal, if I'm not mistaken, there, there are some websites that that do this. Is that right? Yeah, so there is a, a great website, a, a group that I've been partnering with, Future Me. You can go to futureme.org. Um, what's amazing about this site, it lets you write a a, an email to your future self. I guess that needs to be said. It's not, you know, it's a little bit more modern. It's an email and you can specify when the letter will come back to you. So now I can write something and it doesn't just go out into the ether. It eventually will get sent back into my inbox. Um, I've, I've, you know, read about people have done this. I've sort of, I've talked to those who have, who have, uh, tried this exercise. One of the amazing things about this is that it's now you've added this other layer where it's not that you're just communicating to future self, but in a way you're stepping back in time and thinking about who you were. And then that can allow you to step forward in time and think about who you'll be. And there's this like constant level of conversation between selves over time, which to me, it feels like a really wild exercise that can actually make a difference. Yeah, no, it's 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 quite fascinating. There there are a couple of examples. Um, I, uh, I I know I wrote about this years ago. I don't can't remember whether you have it in in your book of teachers who did something like that for their students. Tell us about that because I think we, I know we have some teachers on here on this. Um, and we we have some educators in this audience. Yeah. So tell us about these these extraordinary teachers who have done this sort, taken this idea and put it in place. Yeah, I, so one of them, I talked to this one teacher, um, actually in New Jersey, not in, in South Jersey, not not one of my teachers, but Richard Palmgren, and he would do this for his sixth graders. Um, and he would have them write a letter, a physical letter to their 12th grade self. Um, and then he would have them put uh, several stamps on in case the cost of postage uh, went up. Uh, and he would hold them in his closet. And when those kids turned into high school seniors, he would mail them out. 
Um, and what was particularly interesting about this, this case was that he's been doing this for over 20 years and he has this collection of letters that got sent back to him. You know, the person's mailing it, they might've moved, the mailing address changed or whatnot. And um, yeah, this is, uh, so he um, ends up sort of working with a, a short documentary film company and they find some of these, these kids who are now not kids anymore. They're, some of them are in their thirties mm -hmm. and they read these letters back. And he said it was the most emotional experience. Some of them are moved to tears. And part of what they experience, this is anecdotal, part of what they experience is this, this connection back to who they once were. And it, according to him, and I, I think it, it, it sounds legitimate, uh, some of these folks feel as if they want to reassess their values. Well, what were their values before? And are there things that they can do in their lives now to, to get back to there? Um, but it, you know, it's a great exercise in not just writing the letter and then having it go away, but then actually like making that conversation happen uh, over time. Right. Do you think these techniques have, again, I don't want you to go outside of your lane, but since you're married to a clinical psychologist, you're the son of two <laughs> clinical psychologists, I, I think that gives us a quorum for me to ask you this question, which is, do you think that these kinds of techniques, these letter writing and bridging the present me and future me, um, do you think that they can be effective uh, for people's mental health? So, um, okay, so I, this is, I, there's actually some research that speaks to this. I spotlight it um, in the book. Um, there's researchers who ask people to write these send and reply letters in the midst of COVID. So in April of 2020, um, and found now, and I should say, this is, um, you know, a convenient sample. So it wasn't like they used, uh, clinical patients, which is a, a separate question. Um, but when these folks engaged in that send and reply exercise, um, they experienced a, a lowering of anxiety during this like otherwise very anxious period of time. And part of the machinery there, part of what's happening is that if the exercise forces people to sort of step outside of the here and now, and it allows for this like much bigger picture perspective uh, to see, okay, the thing that I'm doing right now, you mentioned the present microscope, the thing that I'm doing right now feels so big and important but if I step back and write a letter from my future self back to now, it allows me to see the sort of the high, you know, the, the 10,000 foot approach. Right. So it's a, it's another, it's a way of changing, it's a way of changing one's perspective, putting things in, putting things in context, you know, um, uh, temp temporarily. Um, uh, again, just one more story about letters, because I, I find that again, I, I'm thinking about my memory as a reader, the, the vividness, there's a there's an incredibly moving and vivid story of a father in your book, a father who got a, you know, a terminal diagnosis, and he decided to write letters. Tell us about that. I find this incredibly moving. Yes. Yeah, so I, I actually talked to his son. So this is a, a the, the father's Arnie uh, Johansson, and he was, um, I, you know, he was diagnosed with ALS. This was, um, this must have been 30, 30 some years ago. And he, through the diagnosis is he's before the diagnosis, even he's a letter writer. He's somebody who loves to communicate that way with friends. This feels um, like a relic from another time almost. Um, he keeps up letter writing as a form of communication with his, his network um, while he's really sort of um, slowly, uh, you know, progressing through the illness. Part of what he does is write letters, not just to his friends now, but to his family and his kids in the future. So I talked to his son um, who said that the, the day his father died, it was this obviously a horrible day, but minutes after he dies, his mother hands him a letter and it's a letter from his father where he starts reading the things that his father wanted him to think about on that particular day. And there have been dozens of such letters over the years. So he ends up, um, uh, 
he ends up getting a letter, you know, on his 21st birthday, on his 30th birthday, when he has his first kid. And he's now at the point where he's older than his father was when he yeah. died, but there's still letters to come. And I, I love this because it was really not just connecting with, with yourself over time, but connecting with others uh, as well. Right. And it gives us all, I mean, again, the, the moving up through time gives us perspective. It gives us perspective on ourselves. It gives us per ourselves, I guess. It gives us perspective on others. All right. Let's talk about some other research and when we're talking about like what you found, uh, why it's happening, and then what some of the things that we can do about it. So you have some more re recent research on retirement savings that showed that the way you actually frame the um the challenge, the, the 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 task has a pretty significant uh, effect on people's propensity to save. Tell us about that, which you did with your, uh, I think, two UCLA colleagues, or at least one yeah. UCLA colleague. Yeah. So my my colleagues here, Shlomo Benarzi and Steve Steve Shu. Um. So we worked with a uh, fintech company where we asked people uh, if they wanted to sign up for an automatic savings account, and what we did was. I mean, I don't know if it's that tricky, but some people are asked if they want to save $150 a month. Uh, some people are asked if they want to save $5 a week. I'm uh, sorry, $5 a day. Um, now, I mean, this is like, I, I know it's it's the evening, so, but still, I think everyone can probably figure out these are the exact same <laughs> amounts of money, right? $5 uh -huh. a day, $150 a month. Yes. So we thought, okay, this is kind of clever. Um, maybe, uh, you know, of course, by the way, we borrowed this from, you know, mattress ads from the 70s, right? This is something people have been doing for a while. We thought, okay, well, you know, maybe, maybe this will move the needle. Maybe this will get more people to sign up. We were surprised at how effective it was. So four times as many people signed up when it was framed as $5 a day compared to $150 a month. I, I think part of what's happening here is that $5 a day feels a lot easier to undertake. It feels like a sacrifice, but one that's, okay, I can probably figure out something that's five bucks that I can give up. So, you know, the the thinking that's underlying this is like any of these trade-offs between now and later, it's always current you who has to do the sacrifice. It's kind of a bad relationship, right? It's like, if, my, if I'm always the one sacrificing for my partner, like that wouldn't be a good relationship, right? And that's, always what happens with the saving or exercising, et cetera. And so um, part of what we're trying to do there is just make that sacrifice feel easier uh, to go through and to undertake so that it doesn't seem like I'm always the one sacrificing here. Um, so, and, and tell us the size of the effect, because I remember, right, it was, it was pretty significant. Yeah, so it was, so about 28, about 30% of the people signed up when it was $5 a day. Uh -huh. Compared to 7%, compared to 7% when it was $150 a month. So, so a 4x different from that simple framing extra from that simple framing exercise. And if you think about like the bang for the buck there, uh, it's oh, yeah. really quite incredible. Are there ways that those of us who aren't in fintech, who are just trying to get through the day, uh, maybe do more exercise or perform a little better at work or help out our kids or yeah, uh, you know, are there ways that we can enlist that particular technique in our in our individual lives? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's important to note, like part of what we're doing, it's a little psychological trick, right? So I'll, I'll answer your question in a second, but it's you know, it, it's actually helpful to think about this in that particular study. After a month, there were more people who dropped out from the five dollar a day framing than the hundred fifty dollar month condition, probably because a bunch of people said, "Oh my gosh, this is." This is like $150 a month. I don't, I shouldn't be saving this much. Um, the reason I say that is because these are little tricks and we have to figure out a way to sort of implement them so that we're not just tricking ourselves at first, but that we sort of follow through with something. So, you know, one thing I like to think about in terms of translating this, you know, not in the sort of the fintech space or even the financial space is are there other ways that we can break goals down or even uh, any of our experiences down into smaller chunks that do okay. feel manageable, right? right. So you, you brought up exercise. Exercise is a perfect one. Um, I, I, I do like to run once I eventually get on the run. 
uh, but I have a really hard time getting started on it. And the, sometimes the prospect of going on a 30 minute run or whatever it is seems daunting. And so, I mean, again, this is a little trick, but I'll say something like, what if, what if I were to just go on a five minute run and then another five minute run? I, I, there's something that feels so sort of silly about this, but it just makes it easier to say, okay, I'm just going to like, I'm just going to start, I'm making this a little easier. It doesn't feel like this big behemoth thing I have to do. Um, you know, and if, I'm hoping that we can sort of translate that into other spaces as well, but that's the way that I sort of put these into these sorts of lessons into practice in my, in my own life. Yeah. I mean, and, and I wouldn't, you know, I, I mean, again, just my own point of point of view here, but I, I wouldn't, you know, diminish it for being a trick because it's helping people do things that they want to do. And that, right. that are, you know, that are, that are, that are, that are good for them. And so I think we're all looking for those kinds of, those kinds of things, particularly, you know, when, when, when future, when, when present me is, is, is lazy and profligate and future me is going to um, be pissed that he, he was present me is, is lazy, is lazy and profligate. Um, let's talk about time again. You, um, one of the things that you often hear from professionals, working parents, especially, is that they're busy. And there are even stories about in you know, Harvard Business Review and other places, the busyness trap that we're always busy, 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 busy. Um, you've written a lot, obviously studied a lot about, about time. Uh, you've done with, I think, also UCLA colleagues, some work on discretionary time. Tell us about, tell us about that. Um, what what makes sense for discretion for our discretionary time? So the question that you know it's funny the 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 question you're talking about the question that we'd been asking this is with my colleague here Cassie Holmes um, we we had had this uh, research where we were asking okay what do people want more of do they want more time or do they want more money and what do those answers mean for people's happiness but as we started asking these questions um, we we were actually on a a radio show and some one of the callers said, well, I have a question. How much time do we actually need? And I thought this was, but both of us thought this was a, an incredibly deep question where we said, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, it's almost like asking how much money do we need? It's like, I, can I give you a specific answer? So we, we were lucky. We found um, a couple of data sets that spanned tens of thousands of people where mm -hmm. what you can look at is how people actually spend their time. So it's called the American Time Use Survey, um, which I find as a social scientist, I find fascinating because basically you get someone who calls up people and asks them to go through in minute detail, how did you spend each minute of your day yesterday, which is a wild exercise in and of itself. Um, but what you can do from that is say, okay, what amount of that time is spent on quote unquote discretionary things? And the, you know, we can get into the details here, but part of what we're doing is defining discretionary in all different ways. I don't mean just the time that you're not working because there's lots of time that we spend at home uh, where we're doing stuff for others. It's not so incredibly discretionary. What we found was that, or what we were looking for was what's the link between the amount of discretionary time you have and how happy you are? Um, Cause after all, isn't that like, isn't that what we're trying to maximize on here? Um, and so we, it, what, what we found was pretty interesting. As as you have less and less discretionary time, you're less and less happy. I think that sort of makes sense. But then there was this interesting trend where once you got to some sort of optimal level of discretionary time, the relationship between the time you have and your happiness peaks and then starts going downward. With more and more discretionary time, you're less happy. Now, this isn't just like an unemployment effect. It's not a youth effect. We did all sorts of controls here. Um, there's a big caveat, though, which is that how you spend that discretionary time mm. matters. So it turns out that people who spend that discretionary time in, in social ways or in what we would call purposeful ways Mm. then the relationship between time and happiness just keeps going up and up and up, uh, which I, to me, I, it's like, I love that finding because it suggests that it's not that we need more and more time now and later. It's that we need to focus more and more intentionally on how we spend that time to sort of, 
you know, get as much sort of happiness utility out of it as we can. Right. And, and I think I'm going to oversimplify the the sort of the, the some of the foundational research there. But but essentially what we what I think we know and I'm oversimplifying in the same of in the name of uh, clarity and, and pace is that people prefer people are happier when they have more time than more money. But people predict the opposite. They say, what do you what will make you happier? More money. Uh, what will really make you happier, more time. But then there's a knock on of that of like, what do you do with your time? Which leads to a question. We've gotten a few questions, um, several questions over the over the transom here. And, and one of them has to do with um, this idea. And I, I think it's related is, do you, this is, do you have thoughts on how to apply some of these ideas to the third and, or fourth quarter of your life? I, I think that future you looks different. Obviously future you looks different. When you're a 20, you're a 25, you're, you're my son, who's a college sophomore, who's 20 years old, versus his father, who's older than 20, versus somebody who is maybe 65 or, or 70. You have thoughts about that? And does it connect to how we spend our discretionary time? Yeah, so I mean, it's, I, I should start by saying that so much of my research is focused on the you know the first and second <laughs> portions of life right and in right. part because if you start i started from the lens of financial decision making that that's yeah, of course. i really want to get people right yeah um so i haven't specifically done research looking at um older uh generations and older adults in terms of their relationships with future selves. Though I do have a couple of thoughts because it is something that I'm actively starting to investigate, which is okay. a question I have is, is it the right motivator to ask someone in their 60s, 70s, 80s and beyond to think about their own individual future self? Or might it be more worthwhile to really inject sure. that image of future selves with others? Um, which I think is you know, naturally probably one way to go about it anyway. Um, so, you know, another, like we talked about the age progression stuff. I don't think that would be the best thing to do. Uh, if I'm much older, that's not really going to, to help. I know what I look like when I'm older. Yeah. yeah. And is it going to change? Um, but trying to bring up how my decisions now are not only impacting me, but impacting those around me and then beyond, in terms of beyond my own lifetime, that's a question that I have right now in terms of could this be something uh, that's motivational at that stage of life? Um, Very interesting. Now, you, you asked about time though too. I was sorry, you, you asked about time as well. Um, one thing that we see in the, in the research is that as time horizons shorten, people spend more of that time on emotionally meaningful people and emotionally meaningful pursuits, right? And so we see that, and I think it's also a call to, to do that. In other words, it's a call to focus more on what actually matters versus what might, what might be good now and possibly later, but really instead let's focus on the, the, the time spent doing things that matter. It, right. This is some of the work that Laura Carsonson, your PhD advisor, has done. Um, but, you know, to me, it, it, like there's some interesting research that has come out sort of spottily on on um, retirement and why sometimes people, when they retire, they become less happy, even though if you're French, you're supposed to be delighted once you retire. And there's <laughs> there are literally protests in the streets about changing the French retirement age from 62 to 64. Um, and, 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 and my hypothesis, and I think it's confirmed by some of your work and some of Laura Carson's work, is that it depends on what you do during that yeah. retirement. And if you're doing things that are active rather than passive and meaningful rather than hollow and social rather than isolated, I think you're going to be happy. I mean, I think yeah. it's that, you know, so, so, so things that so, so active, connected and meaningful are, are, are to me is like the, the three legs of that stool um, in that, you know, the, the stage of life that I am getting ever edging ever closer to. Well, and that's exactly right. I mean, you said you said it really well, and I'll add one layer, which is that part of the difficulty in thinking about this stems from what I think is probably a pretty outdated notion of retirement that, it, you know, yeah. this period of time where you're just not working. That means very different things to different people. And it means different things now when we have that many more 
uh, you know, that many more, um, that much longer of a period of time to, to deal with. Right. Um, now let's talk about um, something else you said about sort of in, in a certain stage of um, in a certain stage of life, um, you, it might it might be advantageous to think about the future other cells, future the futures of other people. But in um, one of the things that's interesting in, in some of the financial research is that you have a, a singular focus on individuals, and um, and a lot of financial decisions are made as pairs, as 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 couples, as partners. As I mean, we know from research that people with you know joint checking accounts are. I think this is right. People with joint checking accounts uh, are happier, even if you control for all the all the other stuff. So should we, are there ways for us to think, those of us who are partnered, is are there ways for us to think about not only future me, but future we? Yeah, so um, first off, you're absolutely right that you know you can do the research and actually like force people to have a joint checking account and they're happier, it creates more transparency. Forcing, forcing um, them. Yeah, for a lit, oh, I mean, literally an experiment. Research. Okay, got it. All right, yeah. I see, I see, okay. Sorry, uh, forcing maybe not be the best word, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah I get it. I get it. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, now, uh, but but your question is is a great one, and it's it's again, it's not research that I've done yet. Um, but to the extent that we could think about a couple or a relationship as an entity, I think it raises the question of whether or not I can think about the sort of current state of that relationship as well as the future state of the relationship. It gets more and more complicated because now I'm not just thinking about me and future me, but I'm thinking about me and future me and my partner and my future partner and the sort of relationship and the future relationship. So this can obviously get endless, you know, there can be endless layers here, especially when we add in kids and other relatives, et cetera. Um, but I love the idea of that as an exercise to try to figure out sort of where do we want to go uh, moving forward. Right. Um, now, I want to come. I want to offer a few things that sort of distill some some. There are many many practical tips here in, in the book, but there there are two that I think are just powerful um, and everybody should be using. So one of them is uh, going. T tell us about the yes dam effect and how to replace it with the with no yay. So the the yes dam effect. It's it's got to be my favorite. Uh, my favorite named effect in psychology. Basically, it's the, it's so descriptive. It's getting asked to do something four months from now, five, six months from now. I look <laughs> ahead, I see this empty calendar and I say, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Time passes, I get there and I look at my calendar and I'm like, damn it, I wish I hadn't agreed to that thing. Um, it's, you can imagine how it happens, right? We look ahead, we, fail to consider all of the different things that will pull our attention and our time away, just as it happens right now, right? We're always busy in the moment. In the future, it somehow looks wide open. It's another case where we can sometimes do a disservice to our future self, right? By locking ourselves into too many things. There are, of course, cases where maybe it was good to say something that we wouldn't have otherwise said, you know, yes to it. Who knows? It worked out to be an interesting opportunity. Um, I I have a, a colleague, Dilip Soman, uh, who, when I was talking to him about this research, he said, oh, no, no, I do something different. You, you brought it up, Dan, when he gets asked to do something, if he doesn't want to do it, if he says, would I do it next week? If the answer is no, he thinks it'll still be no in four months or five months or six months from now. So I'm going to say no to this but he still puts it on his calendar as a thing he declined. And then he says, you know, I say no. And then months go by and I say, yay, I didn't do that thing. So now I look, no you look at your effect. calendar. It's, oh, I'm so <laughs> glad I declined this. I think that's a, I think it's a, I think, I think that's a brilliant technique. I, I also think that the, 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 the heuristic of saying, don't say yes to anything that you wouldn't say yes to if it was next week is also a pretty useful technique there about that, you know, sort of making an error in forecasting. I, I think so. Although I'll add, you know, I think there's nuance there, right? Because sometimes there are things that it it does make sense to say yes to um, that we might not say yes to next week. And, and sure. the fact that we're being asked to do it months in advance can actually get us to do something a little bit more. Another way that I like to think about this is, is not just the heuristic of would I do it yes or no next week, but trying to connect it back to sort of like 
I don't know, for lack of a better term, like my central mission, right? So um, it's easy to just look at any sort of thing we get asked to do in isolation. It's easy to say like this thing or that thing. But if I start thinking about the the values that matter to me now and the values that I think will continue to matter, matter to me later, that's a case where I can start saying, well, let's use that lens to answer yes or no to whatever the thing is that I'm possibly going to say yes to. Good advice. Good advice. One other thing that I think is essential, and I, 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 I dole out this advice all the time, you write about it in your book, is the importance of surrogation over stimulation. Tell us about that. If people take nothing else from this time together, surrogation, surrogation, and surrogation. So simulation is when I try to think ahead and say, how will I react to a certain thing? If I ask you, you know, do you think you'll like this job or do you think you'll like this potential dating partner? Most people say in trying to answer that, you know what the best way to answer it is? I'll try to simulate my feelings in the future. The problem is we're really bad at doing this. So like we're really <laughs> bad at predicting our feelings. We're bad at stepping into the shoes of our future selves. And so some of the research that I spotlight in the book suggests that maybe a better way to do this is not to simulate, but as you said, to surrogate. And what that means is ask someone who's already gone through the experience, uh, is this something that would be meaningful, good, bad, whatever the word is. We tend to not want to do this because we think we're these unique creatures that nobody, nobody who's lived before us has ever, you know, experienced things just like me. When in reality, averages work out for a reason. And if I talk to somebody who's gone through the experience as me, that may actually end up being a more accurate prediction of my own feelings about that experience itself. And so it is a case for surrogation over over simulation. Yeah, it's it's so it's it's so helpful. We we like to think we're singular and in our own way we are, but in, at some level we're very much like everybody else. Okay, so we're going to do some rapid fire to get out of this um how um I'm going to ask you three very short to give me very short answers to these questions as, as we try to bring this home. Uh what's one thing you've changed your mind about? Okay, I used to think much more that we should be, you know, when push comes to shove, doing things for the future and not for right now. And I've flipped to think there are plenty of times when it makes sense to prioritize the present uh, and to do so in a way that we will look back on uh, fondly and positively. Interesting. Okay. So this is, I mean, the educators in here know this technique from in pedagogy where you say, I, I used to believe now I believe it's a brilliant technique. All right. Uh, what's one book, either recent or classic, that you would recommend everyone read? Okay. Um, okay. So it's fiction. So I'll step outside of my nonfiction lane. Um, <clears throat> a Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer oh. Egan. I, it's what well, it must be 10, 10 plus years old now, yeah. maybe more. Um, I love it because it focuses on these different uh, friends in New York who have these sort of varying degrees of connection, but then follows them through time. And you see how sort of one connects to another and all these threads that spin out. And I just, I just think it's, the, it's this beautiful portrait of people moving through time together and separately. It is also, I'll add uh, as, a little, as a literary footnote here, uh, pretty much the only novel that tells part of its story in PowerPoint. So it has that going forward yes. as well. Yes, uh, that's right. Third and final, uh, what is one, you're a professor, you're, you know, you're a scholar, you're a very, uh, people should know you're a very accomplished teacher as well. You, you don't always see that, someone who has left a mark on scholarship, but someone who is actually an accomplished and, and beloved teacher. Um, what is one piece of advice you would give to students, whether they are K-12 students or university students? Um, that's a fantastic question. Uh, probably to have fun doing what you're doing. Hmm. So I think it's so easy to say, I'm going to do this thing because it's the thing that's going to get me into X, Y, and Z next position in the next chapter in the next chapter. All that's, all that is so boring without the enjoyability component. Uh, and so, you know, not focus on your passion, definitely not that, but 
focus on the thing that you enjoy doing uh, and see where that that spins out. I think that's I think that's uh, I think that's fabulous advice. Uh, I've enjoyed talking with you. Should we can we bring Lonnie back on uh, to wrap us up? And yeah. and if you I didn't get to very many audience questions here, but if you have audience questions, um, you know, there's a, there's an after hours too, so I get an, I get to have another hour with this guy, and I hope Absolutely. that you do too. Well, thanks for that ramp there, Dan. Appreciate it. A uh, great interview. No surprise there. Thank you so much for your service, both to Hal and to Fan and to our community. Uh, one question I had uh, that someone put in ahead, um, ahead of time, actually, I'm kind of curious about this question, was that uh, Joan had asked, I'm curious on your take about how to envision how kids' future selves will be affected by AI. I'm wondering if you have any AI angle hmm. here. Um, and actually, our friend Dave Nussbaum, who connected us as well, Dave Nuss Nussbaum gave us a link to what you looked like yourself, Hal, the before and after. They'll put that link in chat as well, the old Hal and the young Hal, <laughs> or unless you don't want me to, unless you're like, please don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I probably look more like old Hal now, but um, <laughs> you know. uh, yeah, no, I mean, the, this is a, this is like the, the question of the day, right? And so, I mean, I wish... I wish I knew the answer, of course, what what I'm the way that I've been thinking about this is that this is another case of or this is a case of a situation where the future is just so uncertain. Um, I know there's all sorts of, uh, you know, predictions about how things will go. We can't know uh, right now. And so, you know, trying to obsess ourselves with with trying to know is could be could be, uh, uh, you know, a fruitless endeavor. Um, but we can pay attention in the same way that I think we can pay attention to the um, everything else that's happening in our own lives outside of AI, outside of any of these other big societal things. Uh, and, you know, one way to think about this is that it may mean that it's not wise to rigidly plan, but to plan in a way that allows for some flexibility with whatever is going to come uh, in this space. Yeah, I appreciate that. Okay, any final, as we close out, any final thoughts, Hal? Oh, I love this conversation. Um, Dan, thank you so much for asking all the great questions. Final thought for me would be, um, you know, as we think of these future selves, they are different people, but that doesn't mean uh, that we can't do things for them now. Um, that will also impact us positively uh, in the moment. Uh, but I'm also really looking forward to the after hours. Thank you for setting this up, Lonnie.